How are you guys? It's your boy Victorious, and welcome back to another podcast. This podcast, man, I look forward to it every single day. Um, it's the One Micronesia Podcast. Um, this is another episode. We feature so many beautiful and awesome pe- Micronesian uh, folks out there who do so much for the community. And today, I gotta say, uh, I got the message on the WhatsApp. You know, Ed. You know, from uh, Manietlu and Micronesia Resource Center hit me up. I was like, yo, bro, you know, how does it work? How do you put people on the podcast? And I'm like, oh, you know, just wait, who do you got? And he was like, oh, I have Yolanda. I have Yolanda from Chuk. I'm like, what? Like, what? Like, are you, like, are you sure? I'm like, is it the Yolanda Joa Mori? And she's like, he's like, yeah, bro. Can she go on? I was like, yeah, of course. If it's Yolanda, you have to put her on. So that's how we got the, the you know, to start setting up all this podcast, and then, of course, it fell through yesterday, uh, and then it confirmed, and we're here today. And, of course, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only uh, climate change activist, Yolanda Joab Mori. Is that how you pronounce your yeah. last name? Yeah. All right. So, Yolanda, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, sit down with me here at the podcast and just talk. Honestly, just talk and just talk about a lot of things, you know. Yeah. Um, so, let's start with uh, getting to know you. Me. Um, I was just on your um, Instagram. I just followed you, and I just looked at it, and I was like, yo, 74,000 followers. I'm like, am I, am I looking at the right Instagram, or did I follow the wrong Instagram? It's pro- I feel like I don't have that many really? followers. Really? Okay, probably, okay I, need to go, I need to go Instagram check again. But I was just on there, and I was on your Facebook, and recently saw that you were just at um, uh, a climate change. Um, from, was it, is it a climate change? No. It was, it was for... Um, it was an Obama thing. Yes. Yes. So I saw that video. We're going to we're gonna get to that okay. towards the end because okay. I want you to get into it because you got to go one-on-one with Obama. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so we'll get to more details about that towards the end. But let's start from the beginning for you, uh, where it all started. And um, I was also on YouTube. And I watched a video. Um, COM celebrated their 25th anniversary, I believe, like two years ago. Mm-hmm. And you did a, a video. Uh, you were featured. You were one of the featured um, alumni. Um, so let's talk about how it all started for you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm an alumni of, of COM, and I guess my beginning with, with climate change activism began with um, this program that we worked on. It started in 2011, and it focused on climate change education and adaptation, which was community-based. So this was kind of the first formal education program that focused on climate change. And we started out in six schools in just Pompe, Mm -hmm. and then we branched out to 50 schools across the region in the FSM and the Marshall Islands. And it really grew from there. Um, We were in schools talking about what climate change was when not really a lot of Mm -hmm. people were talking about it yet. This was 2011, and it's been kind of amazing to see the the evolution of the topic grow so thus far, Mm -hmm. like right now. It's one of the biggest topics at the forefront of people's minds. And I think, I would like to think that awareness uh, that programs like that did um, helped help that along. Um, and we also did community-based adaptation projects. So we would go into communities, bring everyone together to the table and develop what we called community action plans. And from there, uh, do projects that would help them adapt uh, to the climate impacts that they were facing. So things like... Uh, refurbishing seawalls, to raising taro patches, to mangrove reforestation, Mm -hmm. uh, rainwater uh, harvesting systems. Um, And it was always, um, you know, very personal also because, you know, we're from the islands and this is an impact that was intertwined with living Mm day-to-day life and being from a family of farmers and fishers. Um, And through that, I sort of stumbled upon activism life Mm -hmm. um, because of that work being my foundation and wanting to share that story. Uh, I was invited to one event um, that I spoke at in Hawaii, and from there just kind of blew up and just took on a life of its own. I've been telling that story ever since. Wow, Um, beautiful. Um, How has it been for you as a um, a woman from, you know, uh, Micronesia, a woman from Pompeii, living in Chuuk? How is uh, being, how is that, because, being a climate change activist is um, it's one thing to just you know, talk and you know just throw the message out there. It's always there, but then you know people kind of at one point you're actually talking to, to actually make the change is one of the biggest part. How has that um, been for you? Like, has, have you have you been have you faced problems along the way, or has has it been just a smooth ride? Like, you know what, it's just working. People are listening. Is it because ups and downs? Yeah, we, we get that. Has, yeah. No, it, I wish it were smooth. I mean. It's difficult, especially as, 
you know, you have this thing with being Micronesian, being a woman, and being younger. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and that's, you know, it makes it challenging to, to break into just certain spaces, um, but it's necessary, especially when I enter spaces like international platforms at the UN or what have you, and there's a lack of representation from women in general, from Pacific Islanders in mm-hmm. general, let alone Micronesians. Um, so that's always difficult. Um, you know, being the youngest person in the room or being the only woman in the room or being the only Micronesian in the room, but we have to, we have to be there. We have to represent our stories and tell it from our perspective because I feel like our history and, and the growth of our people and, and, and as a nation, we've constantly had other people telling our stories mm-hmm. and it, we need to tell it with our own voice. And honestly, what you're doing, um, I've seen... Um Kathy from the Marshall Islands, she's, she's out there too. Uh, I think it's, it's really, it's, it's a really good thing. And, um, you know, coming from us, what you said is, uh, it's a mm-hmm. huge thing. And it, it, it really answers the question because somebody else, like you said, can, can, you know, can speak on behalf of us. But when we're out there saying like, no, like, you know, we're, we, we experience this on a day to day. Yeah. You know, I think that really um, answers the, the question and will push for um, better uh, resolutions. Um, let's talk about some of the, because um, you've been to a lot, not just one, not just two, like a lot of summits and stuff you've been, uh, that you've represented F- uh, the Micronesia FSM region out there. Uh, let's talk about some, uh, some of those. Yeah, this year in particular was huge. Uh, for the first time, I went to the United Nations headquarters what? in New York. Yeah, I was, yeah. That um, might feel, I, I don't know how to feel because I'm, the feeling though yeah, uh, the is, feeling is crazy. We see it on TV all the time. Yeah. Like, we're from the little island, so right. like we always see this on the TV yeah. and the movies. Like, oh, my God, the United Nations. Yeah. How's the feeling to step in to the United you Nations? Know, it was surreal. It was surreal. And to, um, you know, it was definitely, my husband came with me. And so, you know, I usually go alone because, you know, that's, you know, that's just how it works. But um, we, we made sure that uh, my husband came with me. I, we wanted, I wanted him to be there because it's definitely been a family effort. Um, doing the work that I do and leaving home so much and traveling a lot. Um, you know, we have kids and we have a family and uh, it's sacrifices, but going to the UN for the first time, like when I got that invitation, it was a certain sense of, I don't want to say validation, but it, in some way, mm-hmm. in some sense, it kind of was because it was like, wow, like this is the international decision-making body. Mm-hmm. Like this is, this is it. And the fact that they were interested to hear what I had to say, um, it meant a lot. And it, and it kind of made me feel like the sacrifices being made along the way um, were worth it. So stepping into that, literally just the building, going through security, I was like, don't be weird. Oh, British security yeah. was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was. Like, um, like triple, double, like, yo, you go through like three, I don't right? know, metal detectors, whatever. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, I spent a lot of time writing that piece, and it was it was the hardest one I think I had to write because you know knowing the audience and, and it being the international community, um, it was for the EcoSoc Youth Forum, and it wasn't just focused on climate change but on the sustain, sustainable development goals agenda, and you know I wanted to be able to write something and deliver it in a way that could resonate with not just us and Micronesians uh, as a people, but trying to find ways to connect with everyone mm-hmm. in that room. And you know, I've been practicing and preparing for it and trying to just, like, be authentic. And when I finished, like, I, I was, I'm not, try, not trying to, like, brag or anything, but when I finished and then the president of the forum stood, stood up mm-hmm. and she was clapping her hands and the entire room rose to their feet, that I did not prepare for. Like, I did not mm-hmm. expect to be standing amongst the standing ovation, but it kind of signaled to me that like, you know, this story is important and people are hearing it. And that was, that was pretty cool. That's nice. Um, I want to bring you back to that, the piece that you wrote. Now, I'm not going to tell you to read the whole thing, <laughs> but like what's that, if you were to pick a part of it or a uh-huh. piece of it mm-hmm. that you want to share right now, which, mm-hmm. what would it be? So the title was Believe in Better. That was, that was what I ended up calling it because, you know, it's hard, you know, doing the work that we do in all, across all sectors, uh, it can be difficult. And, you know, the end main point to the piece was, you know, we have to believe in better in order to do better. And we have to do better because everything counts on it, you know. 
so you 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 were there. Mm-hmm. You did your you did your you delivered your your piece. People loved it. I'm pretty sure. And um, how is it? Because when you like when when I first heard about climate change, mm-hmm. I first heard about that when our teacher in high school mm-hmm. made us watch. Uh, I believe it's called the Inconvenient Truth mm-hmm. by former president or he ran for president mm-hmm. uh, Al Gore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's where I got introduced into climate change, Mm-mm. which was huge. And what from what from what the the documentary had, I was just like my like mind blown. I was like, yo, this mm-hmm. is is this really happening? Mm-hmm. And it, it's true, it's happening. We see it uh, today. We see mm-hmm. sea level rise. You know, mm-hmm. back home, uh, in Yap, in Chuk, in mm-hmm. Pompeii, you know, in especially our brothers sisters in the Marshall Islands, mm-hmm. it's affecting them. So it's it's really affected them. Yeah. So we have activists like you, Kathy, who are out there just pushing the message. Um, do you think it's? Do you think the message is getting through to our leaders? Because remember, you're pushing this not only to world leaders, but at the same time, you have to push it through our local leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely. I mean, I think our leaders aren't so much the ones that need to be convinced. Um, President Banuelo, who was uh, inaugurated this year, has made climate change a priority for okay. his administration. Awesome. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And you know we have our we have the Decum uh, department in, in our national government, and we have organizations at every state level, like the conservation societies, EPAs. And there's several programs ongoing throughout uh, the country that focus on climate change adaptation or mitigation or disaster disaster response and relief. Um, it's not so much the same story with world leaders, and it mm-hmm. just depends on who you're talking to, and it, and that's where that's where it gets complicated. Um, you know. While we have some, cer- I'm not going to mention names, but certain countries, leaders that uh, claim to not believe in climate change and are actually withdrawing from agreements, um, where we see that happen, we do see a lot of a lot of local leaders, state level leaders uh, that are rising to the challenge. Um, I think, for the most part, it's not about convincing people anymore. I think, for the most part, a lot. The conversation has 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 made that shift. It's the action that's not that's not corresponding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and I think that's what's important. I yeah. think what's important is we're out there and we're pushing the message, but we need the backing mm-hmm. of our government. And mm-hmm. you say, and, and we've seen, and I've seen it. I, I've been home uh, for the past couple of years. Every time I visit, there's always uh, a new thing that's happening. Uh, you're talking about tower patches being, you know. They're doing stuff there. Um, you know, the sea level rise part. People, you know, there's fundings that are going into to, 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 to making these things happen. So that way, we're prepared and getting ready as climate change, you know, comes through. So that's happening. But so, it's an awesome thing that you guys are doing. Um, next question here is, you. It's been. Uh, it's been really. It's really hard to. Um, how has it been to you as a young Micronesian? Um, you're out there. You do, you're, you're still young, so you're rep- representing our side of the, the generation. What would you um, tell the younger generation? How would you tell them about climate change? Mm. That's a good question. Um, we always, when we used to do our classroom mm-hmm. visits, we would you know, start with, uh, the, you know, who... Who here knows what climate? And this was, you know, back a few years back, and we would ask kids, you know, who who, who knows what? Who's heard of climate right. change? Um, and before the no hands would right. go up, mm-hmm. um, and you know, we'd start the conversation with differentiating between weather and climate, and and then localizing it because it can be this big, uh, you know, complicated, uh, really big topic or idea to to break down. So we would localize it. And after going through definitions and meanings and the science behind it, connecting it to, to home is what's important. And it's kind of, and then when we start getting into those kinds of conversations, especially in the community with, with people who, you know, live day to day depending mm-hmm. on our natural environment, that's when, you know, it starts to, the puzzle pieces start to fit together. I always say it's kind of like the situation where you're putting a name to a face, like, you're emailing with someone for so long and then you finally meet them in person and then you have that connection. It's kind of like that. Um, When we talk about what it is, 
and how it's this global issue and you know all the factors that contribute to it and why it is what it is and then how it affects us uh, in the kind of communities that we live on, that's when these lights start going off like, oh, so this is why mm -hmm. this is changing. This is why breadfruit seasons is different. This is why we see coral bleaching. This is why this, this, this. And that's when, I think that's why it's important to, to, to make it make sense for, for where we are. So what's, um, let's talk about tips maybe. Because when we talk climate change, we talk about, you know, how, the, the way to do it is us. Which, mm -hmm. us to, we have to uh, change our lifestyles, the way that we do things. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, one of, the big, one of it, the big things about climate change is the emission. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so how would you, what are some of the tips that you would tell mm -hmm. people, okay, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, this is how we can help. Mm -hmm. Not, I want to say stop, it's mm -hmm. because I, I think the word stop to climate change is what we want. But it's going to be so hard. But how do we kind of slow it down? That's, mm. what, what are tips, like um, stuff that you would tell people? Yeah, so uh, so I was working for CPUC, the mm -hmm. utilities mm -hmm. back in Chuuk, uh, as the head of renewable energy. And I think that's a big way that we can, as, as an entry point, mm -hmm. um, for, for the company itself or even consumers, household level, individual level, is really start being mindful of how we use energy and then where we get it from. CPUC is, is currently uh, doing a lot to try to transition and, and integrate more renewable energy, mm -hmm. particularly solar energy, mm -hmm. into the grid. And even though it's not even a drop in the bucket for in terms of global emissions, mm -hmm. um, it's a start. And it also adds validation to, to us as a country or as people when we uh, petition for, advocate for climate action abroad. Um, so yeah being mindful of how we use our energy uh, in any ways that we can access renewable energy, uh, do that. Um, and, you know, climate change is, is, is this bigger outer idea, but it's also really about at the heart is just caring for our environment in mm -hmm. general. And any way that we can do that from refusing plastics to conservation uh, are also really important steps that anyone can take. Let's, uh, let's go talk about, let's fast forward. Um, like I said, I was just on your Facebook, um, and I saw you share a video. And not only I saw like a couple of people tag you in the video. You were at the Obama Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it was at a summit. Um, it was in Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. That's huge. Uh, I mean, I saw the the video. I played it, and you were featured in some of the interviews. And I'm like, yo, this is huge. Like H U U U U U G E, huge. How was it? Tell me, like, just break it down, girl. I can't even. Oh, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still so like, still processing. I still can't <laughs> believe it happened. Like, it was incredible. It was incredible. So it was the Obama Foundation's Asia Pacific inaugural leadership program, and I applied for it a few months back. And when I got in, I was. I was floored. I was. I didn't. I wasn't really sure if I would get in. You know, I was like, "Oh, this is going to be so competitive." Mm -hmm. I don't. They said they got like over seven thousand applications, and wow, they only took two hundred. Um, it was amazing. It was the 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 community itself, the cohort itself, mm -hmm. the other participants from all around the Asia Pacific region. Um, we had uh, Kalena from the Marshall Islands. We have we had a uh, Kafar from um, Palau, and all these incredible young people doing amazing, amazing things. And I was just in awe from being around them, learning from them mm -hmm. and listening to, to their stories. Um, but being in the same room with President Obama and Michelle that Obama, I got to say, it was pretty... I was just excited to be, like, in the same room as them, like, just right? breathing their oxygen. <laughs> I didn't think I would actually, like, get to meet him and what? have a conversation with him. And that was... I'm still I'm still waiting for the the official photos to be shared. Uh, my husband still doesn't believe it actually happened. It's true, Alan. It's true. It actually happened, and yeah, we'll <laughs> he's like, I don't believe it. I just want to yeah, see the picture. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. So you went to the sum. The yeah. you went to that. It was like you said, out of what two three thousand applicants, two hundred were chosen. You're one of the two hundred, which is crazy. 
let's take some uh, some of the let's talk about some of the the takeaways from yeah. from the conference because it's a huge thing. I mean, when you talk about the Obama yeah. Foundation, these guys are out there doing big things mm -hmm. in different with, with the different criteria and stuff like that. But what's your takeaway from it from that whole? Oh man, so many. Um, I've got to say, just you know, the fact that they do this program in the foundation in and of itself, I think speaks magnitudes to how much they value um, young leadership and the fact that they're investing so much in grooming emerging leaders from around the region um, signals that you know that this is this is important uh, to be to be bringing up uh, youth mm -hmm. so I think that's one key takeaway um, there were several workshops throughout the throughout the convening um, that focused on different kinds of skills my favorite um, was storytelling Wow. Yeah. Um, so there was a whole workshop on storytelling and the importance of it and how, you know, it's a powerful way to communicate complex messages, mm -hmm. which, uh, which resonated with me a lot, given my work in activism and advocacy. Um, a big theme was also empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Leading with empathy and having conscious, proactive empathy and being able, you know, we're all not going to agree on the, the same thing and you're not right. supposed mm -hmm. to yeah. and that's fine um, but always understanding that the other person from the across the table has dignity and that you have to enter every conversation with respect um, I thought that was great um, the fact that they were emphasizing that so empathy was a huge takeaway um, the fact that confidence and humility are intertwined so if you are confident in yourself mm -hmm. as a leader you are able to humble yourself enough to know that you need other people that are smarter than you, that mm -hmm. are more creative than yep. you, and to surround yourself with people that can make you better. Um, because it's not about the self, it's not about the ego, mm -hmm. it's, about, it's about the community that you're in and, and doing it together. So I think that's something that uh, can be improved on a lot, and I, I was really happy to, to learn more about that. Wow. And then you said after everything, then it went to, you, you guys got into the same room, like I said, yes. with President Obama. Michelle Obama was there too? No, oh, unfortunately not. Life. But you had a Obama in there. That's yeah. one of the Obamas in there is huge, yeah. you know? So you ha you were there and you said, were you like sitting next to him? What was I the, was. Oh my, yeah. I like was. it was like a three, like three people across from each other or like literally like yo what's up my bro like yeah yeah what's up yeah Obama? we're basically Damn. yeah uh, we're basically like this now podcast uh, but he's my <laughs> uncle <laughs> yeah so uh, so three so i had the incredible incredible opportunity of being one of three of the leaders selected to have a private sit down with him wow yeah and um so it was myself hannah from south korea and fonzie from the philippines and we had a 30-minute conversation with him backstage before he went on for his plenary. Um, so it was the three of us, President Obama and uh, one of his senior uh, chief advisors, Bernadette. Um, so we walk into this room and there's just those chairs like in this small circle, like all like Ooh. with an arm's length apart. And we're like, this is going to be an intimate conversation. <laughs> like this is pretty nerve wracking. And we all sit down and we're just nervously waiting and... Um, I don't even remember what we were saying. We were just trying to distract ourselves until until he entered the room. And, um, and there's two empty mm -hmm. seats, right? And there's one next to me. And there's one across. I'm like, please let him sit next to me. And thankfully, just by the way he entered the room, he happened to sit down next to me. So yeah, sat down and talked to President, President Obama. <laughs> wow. I'm gonna ask. Um, and I know there were they, there could have been a million questions in your mind. Let's so, say like you're like, which one do I pick? Yeah. Like, which one did you pick, though? That's what I want oh, to know. Oh, that's so okay. So, <laughs> oh, uh, is, is this supposed to be like a behind the closed doors no, it's thing, fine. or I'll is share it? it? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I'm currently um, transitioning between uh, careers, I would say, um, probably going towards more uh, government work, um, and you know, my whole work life up until now has been very community level, community based. Um, a, aside from from the advocacy work I do um, and so you know I it's it's a big decision it's a big move to make and um, so I wanted to ask him for his advice on how to make that transition because I know his background was being a community organizer mm -hmm, yep. before going into politics um, so I asked him that and he gave me really good advice and wow. he, uh, he he told me you know you got to stay because um, we had talked about my work uh, mm -hmm. a little bit like what I shared with you. 
uh, before I mm-hmm. was able to ask a question. And, uh, you know, he told me about the necessity to stay grounded within the community that, that I'm connected to, that I'm a part of, bringing them with me into the rooms that I go. Um, he said, you know, you're going to be sitting in big meetings, blah, 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 and you're going to be frustrated with how slow progress seems to be. Um, and then he told me this story about this sculptor. He said, there's a, there's a story of the sculptor who um, is chipping away at this marble block mm-hmm. for forever and ever, and it's, it's taking forever, and it's not making any shape. And then one day, he finally strikes it, and it suddenly takes shape. And his assistant says, wow, you finally landed the perfect strike. And the sculptor replies, um, no, it's not about, it's not the perfect strike. It was the thousand ones that came before. Mm. And he told me, you know, you have to believe in that and that you're part of that, the thousand strikes that, that makes it all build up to something, uh, a better outcome. So I was like, okay. Wow. Yeah. Words from the one and only <laughs> President Barack Obama. Oh my God. That's, wow. That's yeah. And, and this is something that you can, you're going to take with you forever. Absolutely. You know, and you're going to tell your kids. Absolutely. Like, you know, mom met Obama, yeah. and you tell them that story, and they're going to tell their kids, and yeah. then their kid, and it's going to go down generation and generation. That's that's amazing. And, yeah. uh, wow. I'm just like, at all, I'm, I, even I'm like, I'm like, yo. I'm like, she's been, like, she's been, like, she's talked to Obama. She, you know, she shares some free words with him. It's like I feel like I like I'm a little you met close. Him too yeah, now. like I feel like I know Obama too through Yolanda, you know? Uh that's crazy. Um, wow. So things are huge for you. So you just you just you're you're back from that. Um I do know you did a couple you, you do a couple of things back home in Chip as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, let's talk you just let's talk about that. Because th- these are awesome programs that you, that you did you create this or is it something you joined? Yeah, so in 2017, my friends and I started a small NGO called Island Pride. Um, And Pride stands for Promoting Resilience Through Involvement, Development, and Education. And this was around the time that the program that we had been working on before that I described um, had come to an end due to lack of funding Mm -hmm. because our funding came through the U.S. and then U.S. priorities changed on climate Mm -hmm. change. Um, So... We didn't know how to stop doing that, so we started our own organization so we could continue that work. Awesome. Um, so basically, it's um, it's meant to empower and engage youth to be proactive stewards of our environment and on climate action. Um, so we we basically uh, open it up to all high schools uh, on Chuk. Uh, we recently finished my favorite activity of the year called the Girls Can Camp. Wow. Yeah, uh, so CAN standing for Climate Action Network. Um, and it was camp for girls, uh, high school, and it was like a week long, and we did it in Chuk and Pompe, and um, um, it was focused on girls' leadership, empowerment, and looking at that through the lens of our own Micronesian mm-hmm. Chukis culture, and unveiling the ways that we are actually significant and not uh, and not anything else that you know we might see, be told to believe from from outside. So. Yeah, just having conversations like that. And then we did um, some technical hands-on practices with them, getting them in the water, um, practicing uh, coral reef monitoring surveys. Mm -hmm. And then they did some coral planting. Uh, So we're going to do some more of that uh, throughout the year. Um, We've also done uh, events like uh, the Youth Speak Up uh, Summit, where um, it was like an essay contest. And then they deliver their essays in the form of a speech to this big uh, summit where we invited... uh, state leaders, local leaders, and members of the community. Um, so things like that. Things, And we always um, have meetings with, with them, the high school students and the youth participants, uh, to steer our agenda. So the ideas of what we're doing come from the youth. We, mm-hmm. we want to make sure it's youth-driven. And we basically gather their ideas and find ways to make it happen. Wow. So amazing programs. Um, and, it, and this is still this is still ongoing, right? Yeah. This is still there. Well, so do awesome, uh, you know, Yes, you need to do what you're doing because it's it, it really and like I said I think the the core and, and I've talked about this to the the other uh, participants in the the podcast is I think the, the key here now if we want to change anything is with the youth yeah definitely so uh, what you're doing you're doing the climate say the climate change part I talked with um, action he's doing the sports side mm-hmm. here on Guam so all these programs uh, the, the that's there is for the youth and I think it's such it's a beautiful 
something that we need to keep doing. Um, now I'm going to switch it just a little bit. We talked about climate change, what you're passionate about. And I want to talk about because um, one of the, the things that people usually ask when you know, um, or something that I want to ask is to to kind of because um, you you you're you're going back to Chuk. You live in Chuk. Mm -hmm. You're from Pompey. You live in Chuk. You're just here to visit, uh, mm -hmm. but you're going back. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about some of the 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 problems you hear on the news. Let's talk. Let's let you. Like I said, I'm, like I said, I'm going to switch it up just a little bit. Not go into depth with you know, but I just want to see your take of early morning. You wake up, you switch on the computer, and boom, like back to back, uh, back like the news says this and that, and we've seen a lot. And I'm talking about the, the micro region, this micro region, that. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you what, what you wake up and what you, what are your thoughts? Um, it hurts. You know, it's mm -hmm. frustrating. Um. I spent a good part of my childhood growing up in Hawaii mm -hmm. and have very real my own experiences with dealing with discrimination and racism and it's still very much alive and well today unfortunately and it's such a loss I feel because so much good could come out of you know if if this wasn't an issue if we could actually see each other as as people as humans and as and as equals um I feel like we get a we, we get a bad rap undeservingly a lot of the times, which is why it's so important for me to, you know, do my best to to paint a different story of, mm -hmm. of who we are as a people because, because, you know, things like that definitely doesn't define us. And you know, and that's what this podcast is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, to bring out the sunshine. You know, because it's, we've, we've been living in the dark for so long yeah. that something needs to somebody needs to. To get out, and I think this is a great one to just pick. You know, there's people out there, and yeah. I think the thing is, that there's people out there who do good every single day, 24 seven. You know, do 24 hour shifts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. People out there are doing good, and it's mm -hmm. just it's not being, you know, pushed out as much as the bad. So I think uh, something like this, and you being a part of this big part, and you're you're the climate, like I said, you're the climate change, uh, um, you're the climate change side. And you're changing it from that way as you, you as we work our way towards something that's going to be um, a beautiful thing, you know. So that's awesome. Um, before we close out here, I I was reading through uh, because before, like I said, preparing for this, I typed in Google like Yolanda Joab Mori, and boom, I was like, boom, it was like pages and pages. I'm like, yo, okay, one one at a time, one at a time. So I was clicking through. I found an interview, and I think this is, would be something nice to kind of close off on. Your favorite quote. Oh. Your favorite quote is uh -huh. Pon Pain, right? Uh -huh. Let's talk about that. Okay, so it was Ngalisti Ji Karakar, which literally translates to bite down on hot bone, but the the essence of that, um, it means it's, it's about perseverance, it's about determination, and it's about, you know, not giving up regardless. And I love it because, you know, it's it's more of a feeling when when people when a punt pain tells you that it's like, okay, I gotta mm -hmm. I gotta step my game, like I can do this, and that's that's the kind of the feeling behind uh, behind Nalistiji Garagar, and I feel like I've been doing that uh, to to navigate my way uh, since ever since. So yeah, that really resonates with me. And I think that quote would be also a good one to actually end this podcast on because we talked about. Um, we just got off of the, the topic of, you know, the d discrimination and things like that. And I think never to give up is one thing that people can take away from this because, you know, because people will, at one point, will think, you know, especially for us who are living on Guam, like, you know what, I'm just going to give up, you know. I'm trying my best to live, you know, the best I can, to give the best I can, but, you know, all this, the news, the negativity, it's ruining me, I'm, I'm just going to give up. Mm -hmm. I think what we can take from this is don't give up. Absolutely. I think just like continue to do you because, you know, one day at the end, you know, we're, we're really going to, you know, resolve this. And, you know, I guess what we're fighting for is unity. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we need uh, mm -hmm. to, to just keep it at the back of our minds. Like just don't give up, just keep going and to do good. And I think that's what people need to know. Absolutely. To, to, to not, you know, deter from, you know, what they're doing and just keep a straight eye. Um, well, Yolanda, well, looks like we talked about your life, you, you know, where you started, where it all started for you, you went on these awesome uh, summits, one, the recent one, you met, you sat next to Barack Obama, which is like, ah, which is awesome to hear that. Um, before we, you know, close it off here, and I was just on, oh, by the way, we're, we're live on Facebook, so... 
a lot of people watching. Uh, Kathleen Roby said, wow, wow. Yolanda. Um, what else we got here? Um, Debbie Davis, he is a big, big fan of KYM. Watches, uh, follows KYM News. He said, half a day, KYM, Victoria, Yolanda, all, and all in Guam watching from Kentucky. Oh, cool. Um, uh, Billy Joe Pelop Iron said, Ponpe on the move. Shaka. <laughs> so there's a lot of people watching this, and we'll continue to watch it as, as it will be posted on uh, later on. So if you missed out, you can always rewatch it. Um, before we leave, what would you, um, what would be your last message or what you want to leave with us here today? Just Alibi. thank you. I mean, I'm so grateful that this podcast exists. It's amazing, and it's, it's, uh, it's so necessary to have platforms like this that uplifts our people and i'm yeah thank you all right well there you have it guys it's yolanda joab mori uh it's been nice oh my god uh <laughs> climate change activist thank you so much for thank all you. that you do continue to do it because like i said I'll, i'm going to be one of your uh biggest uh you know biggest fans thank and you. you know uh supporters so we got you and you know say hi to alvin and the family will do and you can, you can see have a great one thank you so much yolanda thank you very much all right, well, there you go, guys. Wrapping up another episode of the One Micronesia Podcast with Yolanda Joab Mori, and we'll see you guys at the next one. Thank you so much. Bye. Later.